a virus about 300 times smaller than the diameter of a strand of hair, has thrown the whole world off course. Data collected of its dimensions helps us choose masks with a weave fine enough to protect us. Statistics tell us that about 97% of those infected <coughs> develop symptoms within 11 to 12 days, and about 99% will fall ill within 14 days, which explains why it's a 14-day quarantine to keep the community safe. And how did we decide that seniors should be among the first to be vaccinated? Well, that's because we have data showing that it's 10,000 times more deadly for a 90-year-old than a 9-year-old. So, it was numbers like these that helped us form our first line of defence against an unknown enemy. But apart from that, data can also be revealing. It can tell us how much life has changed during these unprecedented times. And we can also draw from them lessons on how to survive and thrive in this post-pandemic world. It's been over a year since the pandemic began. And COVID-19 has changed the way we live our lives. Door handles, elevator buttons, and even hands have all become COVID-coated booby traps. And for most of us, the long commute to the office has now become a few steps to our desk. Instead of long days stuck in meeting rooms, we're now caught up in endless video calls. Who knew the latest fashion accessory would be this? A mask. I can't remember the last time I shook someone's hand. Or performed in front of a live audience. All these small changes hide a treasure trove of data, revealing major social shifts. Normally, I wouldn't get up close and personal with so many people, but this time, we're doing it for market research, for science, uh, with safe distancing. So if we're now a mask-wearing nation, have our eyes truly become the windows to our soul and a pain to our wallets? You see, scientists have actually noticed that the pandemic has changed our relationship with our own faces. But to what extent? I'm going to study that, starting with makeup. Hi, excuse me. So I did this of you. Um, you're looking for makeup today? Uh, yeah. I see. For eye makeup. So we prepare for like our eyes. Because with the pandemic, like we're wearing a mask, the lipstick you can't really see it. Your eyes is the only one you can see. We have actually seen a drop uh, versus a year ago for makeup. However, we are actually seeing like month on month increase in eye makeup. So nowadays, we are always meeting on Zoom. Is there any particular colour or, or type of makeup that has seen a pickup in sales? In the past, people are actually uh, more into buying single colour as well as dual colour applicator for eyeshadow. Now, uh, they have actually shifted more to the colour palettes where there are multiple colours. When we weren't looking, sales of eye makeup were reported to have skyrocketed all over the world. And one of the world's biggest e-commerce companies, Alibaba, even reported eye cosmetics going up 150%. So for many, the pandemic has changed long-held beauty routines. And with masks becoming so ubiquitous, the emphasis appears to have shifted to our eyes. But 
are our masks hiding some serious upgrades underneath? So we're trying to back first, okay, and then just press down. Is it Clear aligners are transparent okay. forms of plastic braces, uniquely tailored to fit each individual. The shape of your teeth is captured using a scan. And from this, a set of aligners is 3D printed. And over the course of between 12 and 18 months, the plastic moulds slowly move your teeth into the ideal position. Less painful and less awkward than metal braces, this quest for perfect pearly whites doesn't come cheap. The treatment can set you back anything from 1,500 to 7,000 US dollars. Open wide. Much more expensive than metal braces. So at a time when some people are tightening their belts, sales of clear aligners are taking off. At least two brands are reporting exponential growth. I don't get it. In this new era of masks and work from home, why are people paying eye-watering sums to sort out their smiles? Hey! Investment banking analyst Tony is one of those people who paid more than $4,000 to get his perfect set of pearly whites. What made you decide to begin the treatment? Why now? Why this year of all the years? When the COVID hits, everybody works from home. So every time I look in the zoo. So that's when I started to really, really seriously think about doing something on my teeth to make myself look um, confident, look better. Tony isn't alone. Four in ten Singaporeans are now more conscious of their smiles with the surge in use of video calls. It's not just orthodontists who are smiling all the way to the bank. Aesthetic doctors, too, are seeing an uptick in business. So, I'm heading from the dentist chair to the examining table. Scientists from the Massachusetts Hospital sent a survey to more than 100 dermatologists across the nation. The results suggest a 56% increase in people seeking cosmetic procedures. It's not just the United States. Cosmetic doctors and plastic surgeons around the world, the UK, Australia, Japan, South Korea, have all reported surges in bookings. It's being called the Zoom Boom. In Singapore, aesthetic clinics are also seeing a rise in enquiries and actual cosmetic enhancements done. From eyelid surgery, to facelift, to lip filler injections. Singaporeans are using this opportunity to get nipped and tucked. Dr. Adrian Wee, a plastic surgeon who's been in practice for more than 14 years, fills me in on how this Zoom boom has been keeping him busy. What is it about Zoom, you know, that has this big impact on how we view ourselves? Teleconferencing with programs such, a, such as Zoom uh, have led to people being more aware of the way they look because mm. they're literally looking at themselves all day on the screen. Since everyone's on work from home, might as well mm. just get it done. Are you seeing more men coming in? Interestingly, yes. In the past, I think men would make up about maybe 10% of my aesthetic practice. Mm -hmm. But now I, I would say it's at about 20 and even 30%. This COVID period has really been the catalyst, I think, for a lot of them to do uh, stuff like uh, droopy eyelids, to crack the droopy eyelids, or even get their eye bags done. All right, so doctor, so with my face, right, how, how can you make it more zoomable? For you, you've got quite uh, obvious eye bags. So I'm just going to do a bit of marking. Minimally invasive techniques would be to mask those lines through the use of fillers. If only this was like a magic pen and wherever you drew it, the corrections just... Oh man, then I'd be out of business. Place the filler product right at the line uh, there. Mm, I think you look great. <laughs> <laughs> wow, okay. Just finished the procedure and it feels numb. I can definitely see some improvement, especially for my left eye. The whole process took, um, what, 10 minutes, maybe, at most? That's as far as I go. There are clearly others who go even further. Dr. Ui recently saw an uptick of 50% new patients in his clinic. Jamie is one of them. So what procedure are you thinking of getting now? 
the it's a surgical procedure. Yeah, it's oh. called the scarless eye bag. You know, can you see the second layer? Yeah. Mm, just a bit. Yeah, it's it's noticeable after you mention it. <laughs> yeah. But it's more noticeable mm -hmm. on Zoom call because for photos you can edit, but on video it's very hard. The proliferation of meeting apps has created new phrases in our lexicon. Zoom boom, zoom face, zoom fatigue. And well, the latest I heard, zoom body dysmorphia. It means finding your own image in a group video call so unappealing that you can't focus on anything else. But how often does that happen? And why do we suffer from body zoom dysmorphia? Dr. Adrian Wang reveals that he too has found himself becoming more anxious during the pandemic. In fact, it spurred him on to delve deeper into the psychology behind Zoom meetings. Having to stare at your own face over a screen for hours on end seems to magnify that problem. So people again start to obsess and dwell over what they perceive as imperfections. And this can uh, worsen their anxiety and their mental health. Is this issue just simply um, us finding ourselves more unattractive? Or is there something deeper? In general, I would say that no, it's not a standalone problem by itself. But it's an important component of many of the things that, that stress people out because of, of the pandemic. How many people do you think in, in Singapore have this, uh, are affected by this um, body zoom dysmorphia? Oh, I see about 15 to 20 patients a day. And most of them have work-related stress from Zoom and virtual meetings. And you multiply that with, with all the mental health professionals and counsellors in Singapore, you come up with a pretty big number. Before the pandemic, many people saw working from home as a luxury. But when we were forced home en masse, many found the office became a long-forgotten dream destination. In fact, a survey conducted on more than 3,000 Singaporeans in the middle of 2020 found that nearly two-thirds of those who worked from home reported feeling stressed. In another survey around the same period, 78% of those in the study said that they were anxious about economic issues. While 37% said they feared contracting the coronavirus at malls or public places. And this stress is manifesting itself in unexpected corners. Third straight day, Singapore has recorded more than a thousand new infections. The region has seen more than 1.35 million cases. More than one million people have died in the COVID-19 pandemic. Over the past year, the world has been focused on the rising number of infections. But it appears our single-minded focus on those numbers may have blinded us to other health issues. I've never liked visiting the dentist, but luckily this time, I'm not getting my teeth checked. Or so I think. I'm here because the National Dental Centre Singapore saw a spike in the number of people seeking endodontic treatment in 2020. Endodontics, a specialist branch in dental treatment that deals with problems such as complex root issues, teeth replacements, cracked teeth, basically badly damaged teeth. And I'm on the dentist chair. Because the spike in cases of damaged teeth has been so dramatic during the pandemic, that Dr. Chua from the dental centre insists that since I'm here for his interview, that I should get my teeth checked. Oh boy. Bite the teeth together. Any pain on the teeth on your function? Um, no, not, not, not usually. Any pain on the jaw joints? Uh, the on the joints, no. Okay, any yeah. headaches in the morning? Headaches, uh, no, not really. Early. Yeah. Just, just, uh, are you aware if you're clenching or grinding? Uh, yes, just uh, once in a while in the daytime. Oh, daytime. I can spot a crack line on the canine. Huh? 
<laughs> okay, thank you. Doctor, I'm just like super surprised that I have cracked teeth. Um, it's due to my clenching. Cracked teeth can happen if you bite very hard foods like eyes and bones. But uh, people do not bite very hard foods. Uh. So the majority of the cases that we see are as a result of clenching and not grinding. There are distinct differences. Oh. So grinding is like you wear off the teeth. Mm -hmm. But clenching is you just bite and bend the teeth. And they bend the teeth and then they crack. According to Dr. Chua, the root causes behind teeth clenching are largely psychological. In the past, we did some research on it. 38% of the patients, they will tend to be moderately depressed. In the centre here, our percentage of females to males is about 80% females to 20% males. Mm. In this pandemic situation, there are issues of the mind, there are challenging uh, times, so I would anticipate this to happen more. Cracks in teeth often come about because of excessive clenching and grinding of teeth at night. Our teeth enamel is actually harder than steel. In the day, the bite force on our teeth ranges from 1 to 10 kilograms. At night, this force can go up to an estimated 30 to 50 kilograms. Imagine that! So, some of us could be busy grinding at night, hmm? I wonder if the pandemic has changed other things that happen when the lights go out. Something I rather enjoy something that most of us probably can't get enough of. I'm talking about sleep lah. In a global survey by an app measuring sleep quality with 70,000 participants, 37% reported taking longer to fall asleep. Since the start of the pandemic, I've been getting way less sleep than usual and what is needed. But then again, I've also got a newborn baby to take care of. I wonder if Singaporeans are also facing the same sleep problems. And I know just the people to ask. The people who work here. Have you ever wondered what it's like to be a sleep doctor? It must be a dream job. Take a seat. Thank you. Dr. Kenny Pang, pioneer of innovative surgical procedures in the sleep medicine industry, that's why you tend to find that your sleep quality is even poorer right now, is passionate about helping people to get some quality shut eye. Since the pandemic, I've seen at least a two or three fold increase in the number of patients that see me for sleeplessness. But why is this so? It's multifactorial uh, stress in the economy, uh, stress in their jobs as well. And now that they have to stay home, there's always tend to be some form of friction going on at home. Most of my patients uh, can range from about 20s to about 50s. Uh. And men, women? Women more. They tend to be uh, more anxious personalities and more perfectionist compared to men. Men tend to be more type B, <laughs> they're more relaxed. I would have thought that because uh, more people are working from home and staying at home uh, longer, then it is we have more time to fall asleep. They take for granted that they can wake up later in the morning, so they tend to sleep later at night. We shift our clock backwards, we mess up our circadian rhythm, and a lot of times this can lead to sleeplessness or even insomnia. So then what do you recommend uh, is the best way to sleep? A lot of my patients are sleepless for a short period of time and I teach them sleep hygiene, sleep regularly every night 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. In a quiet, cool and dark area, they should not use any blue light emitting devices two hours before sleep, no exercise four hours before sleep and avoid stimulants. Wow, yeah. <laughs> like, there's a whole checklist to do. Oh yes, <laughs> but it helps. If you didn't sleep well, or you wake up tired, you'll be moody, irritable, short-tempered, your relationships are affected, your work is affected, your so-called productivity is affected, so your stress level goes up. So this affects your personal self-esteem and your confidence as well. Clearly, stress, sleep and mental health are intertwined. Triggered by the stress and strains of COVID-19, we reach for the junk food. And with work from home leaving us more sedentary than ever before, 
many of us have gone from fab to flab. According to Grab, the start of the circuit breaker saw double the demand for desserts such as frozen yogurt. Fast food orders, specifically burgers and fried chicken, also rose by over 30% during this period. Well, it's no wonder that experts have coined a new term to describe a rise in obesity caused by COVID-19. COVID-obesity. In a global survey conducted in 2020, over one quarter of all respondents said they'd put on weight. In Singapore, the proportion is even higher. One in three people said they piled on the kilos during the pandemic. And of those who gained weight, 30% reported an average increase of around 5 kilograms. A weight gain that's the result of moving less and eating more thanks to the pandemic. A reminder that COVID-19 can hit us even without an infection. In any given period, the National Cancer Centre sees a steady stream of new cancer diagnoses referred to the specialists here. But from February to July in 2020, it reported a nearly 26% drop in new referrals. Well, what, what's the reason for this fall? I think partly because during that period there were real uh, worries about people entering the healthcare facilities, during, especially when during the height of COVID. There was a decrease in, for example, breast uh, mammography done during that period of time. There was a decrease in colonoscopy done during that period of time. And I think those decrease in screening could have contributed in a slight decrease in the incidence of uh, cancer during the period. There might also be a decrease in the willingness of patients to visit the doctors. What are the repercussions of someone coming in to diagnose their cancer a bit later? I think if, if the delay is about a month or two, it's very unlikely that it will significantly impact upon its diagnosis. But of course, if the delay goes on for months on months, then there will be a significant uh, impact. It's always better to treat the cancer at its earlier stages than later stages. A study in the UK estimates that across 20 cancer tumour types, just a six-month delay in cancer referrals would result in over 9,000 fatalities and over 170,000 life years lost. Fortunately for Singapore, it has not come to that. So while Singapore's medical system did not collapse under the pressure of the pandemic, the virus has brought us down in other ways and is hitting us where it hurts. Through a mass of new data, we've seen how COVID-19 can impact us even without an infection. This pandemic has triggered a mental health crisis. More of us are stress grinding our teeth. And emotional eating has left many of us overweight and unhealthy. But COVID-19 has hit us where it really hurts. No, not there. I mean, our wallets. Global economies are suffering the worst recessions since the Second World War. The World Trade Organization reported the steepest drop in global trade on record from March to June 2020. And as a global trade hub, Singapore has been hit hard. The city saw its worst quarter in history over the same period, which also coincided with the start of the circuit breaker. And from the unemployment charts, it is not hard to see who the hardest hit are. This is the unemployment rate of those in their 30s. It rose from 2.3% in September 2019 to 3.5% in September 2020. 
This means that there were about 19,000 people aged 30 to 39 who were unemployed. Now, if we take a look at the same chart for the people aged 40 to 49, not only do we see an uptick in unemployment for this group of people, but the rate was higher and the rate of increase steeper. But amid the dark economic clouds, there has been a secret revolution going on. During the circuit breaker, cash was no longer king and e-payments took centre stage. According to DBS, Singapore's largest bank, digital banking transactions rose 40% in 2020 compared to the year before. There was an unprecedented drop in cash usage of 28%. And in 2020, 460,000 of us paid online for the first time. What's more amazing, about a quarter of that number, which means 120,000, are aged 50 and up. Has the cashless society we have been talking about for years finally arrived, riding on the coattails of a pandemic? I'm banking on e-payment enthusiast Shi Zi Kun to give me the answers I need. So when's the last time you actually used cash to pay for something? Well, I honestly cannot remember. It's been so long ago, I, I can't remember. I, I, I don't believe I, I use cash anymore. I was here four years ago, interviewing about PayLa and, and cashless payments, and um, I felt like it didn't seem to take up until the pandemic happened. Do you think that that was like a catalyst for everyone to go cashless? I think last year was a, was a, was a year where it all came together. The needs arising from the pandemic, uh, where I guess people might not want to touch cash that much. Mm -hmm. We partnered with uh, government agencies to roll out these capabilities to educate a lot of these merchants on digital payments. It's safe, it's convenient, and so we start to see a lot of uh, adoption points. There are already about 180,000 uh, points where you can actually use PayLa. When it came to corporate pay now transactions, uh, that was actually a six-fold increase. SMEs who are traditionally paying uh, through checks have adopted digital payments instead. Would you say like, you know, this is the beginning of the end of cash? Well, um, I would say this is certainly the beginning of a huge transformation, a digital revolution. One day in the very near future, cash could be obsolete. But there's one enduring truth. Where the money flows, crime always follows. And this pandemic has shown that criminals are one of the most resilient and adaptable players of the economy. In 2020, reported cases of traditional crime decreased by 15.3%. That's a drop of 4,000 cases. And yet, overall crime climbed 6.5% in the whole year. That's because scams saw a near 65.1% increase in 2020. Specifically, e-commerce scams increased by 19.1% in 2020 compared to the year before. And the total amount cheated tripled from $2.3 million to $6.9 million. Carousel is one of Singapore's favourite digital platforms for buying and selling items. But in the first half of 2020, they took the top spot for the highest number of scams on digital platforms. Most of the scams involved deals that seemed too good to be true. And in 2020, scams involving masks, hand sanitizers, and thermometers grew at a feverish pace. <sighs> I don't understand how and why people still fall for scams like these. As an online shopper, I can tell if it's a scam just by looking at a person's sales numbers and reviews. Or so I think. I'm at Carousel's office in Singapore, and they want to put me to the test. So yeah, this is the account. What do you think? Um, zero followers, zero following, just joined today. It might be a fake account. What's the difference between a new account, like a legit new user, mm -hmm. and, and a scammer? Even if you're new, some people will try to make it an effort to feel like a real person. You can put out a profile picture, mm. description. Let's take a look at the listings and you can tell me what do you think. 
Okay, so this is a $500 oh, brand new packaging Apple Watch Series 6. Mm -hmm. Shipping register mail. Um, it looks, this, this listing looks legit to me. New accounts, um, they won't straight away like post a very high risk, high value listing. Usually I would think that as like a sign of suspicious activity. Solin is the woman in charge of trust and safety issues at Carousel. Her team uses a mix of artificial intelligence and automated technology to help detect and shut down any signs of suspicious activity. So in 2020, we've deactivated about 50,000 accounts. Mm -hmm. um, this is to prevent bad actors from indiscriminately creating disposable accounts where they scam and move on, mm. scam and move on. How, how successful has, have these measures been? Over the course of 2020, we saw 67% drop in uh, our fraud incident rate. I don't really expect uh, another huge spike like what we saw before. But I think, you know, it'll not go away. Um, in the early months, we saw scams were around masks and sanitizers, right? And then during Circuit Breaker in April, it's all about Nintendo Switch scams oh. <laughs> and PlayStation scams. Okay. So as, as long as the, the next big thing is happening, that's where the scammers are going to go to. Yes, right? yes. So, the criminals have followed us into cyberspace. And if there's one more thing we can gather from these numbers, it's that while we love going online, we love the great outdoors more than ever. In fact, we might be embracing this healthier lifestyle a little bit too hard. Nothing has turned our lives upside down like this pandemic. Since it began, the only globetrotting I've done is on Google Earth. Tilt Earth down. Ha! Whoa! Ho-ho! <laughs> the only parties I've attended are virtual. Hello, happy birthday! Hi, thank you! And all my meetings have been online. Wait a minute, you see even my virtual California. background also doesn't work. So where's the silver lining? In a survey commissioned by CNA, we're driving less. We've also been taking public transport less. On the other hand, we've been doing more walking and cycling. And 40% of us claim to be more active than ever before. In 2019, Singapore organised 116 races. When the virus made such mass events impossible, the runs went virtual. And that's when running fever really hit. Virtual organiser 42 Race saw the number of races in 2020 double compared to the previous year. But what's the appeal of racing on your own? For the most part, Virtual runs require participants to complete a certain distance by a specified date. Progress is recorded via GPS tracking apps and devices, with screenshots uploaded to the organisers as proof. I'm meeting April Cheong, a virtual race enthusiast. Since March 2020, she has taken part in more than 200 virtual races. Now, she's teaching me how to prepare for one. Virtual Run offers flexibility that uh, you can get to choose uh, your own venue, your own time and your own distance. Then, then why the need to join a Virtual Run? Just, every day you just run, you know? It's uh, very motivating because uh, if you set a goal that you want to do a certain distance, then after that uh, you complete it within uh, your own targeted number of days, uh, it, it feels good. It all started um, when I did a 5.5 km over 55 days last year. As in every day, 5.5 kilometers? Yes, I have to clock. So it's I like, see. you know, I've clocked 40 days, you know, I, I have to finish 55 days. So, and then after that, it became a habit. So uh -huh. it's like right now, morning, if I don't start running, 
it, it just something's wrong. Yeah, uh, yeah. Like like no coffee, you know. So, so it's different from mass runs. This one you're running by yourself. The, don't you miss the social aspect of being with people, everyone running together along like Benjamin Shaw's bridge and that kind of thing. Okay, that that's a different joy altogether. Mm. So if for those people who still likes to compete, there's this leadership board, and you can all well, track the runners. You know, um, who is first, then you want to run faster. So what are the other benefits of, of virtual running? Um, it builds up stamina. Uh, you, you can start very uh, short distance and then over a period of time, if you can meet that and you get uh, more motivated or you're more confident that you can do longer distance and then uh, in the longer run, you will get to want to do more things. So let's get me started. Okay, let's do this. Feel the sweat pouring down your face, adrenaline pumping all through your veins. Deep feel ready at the start of the race. Time for glory, push through the pain. Yeah. Our new enthusiasm for running is also triggering a gold rush on running shoes. So even as the economy is doing badly, shoemakers are raking it in. Decathlon Singapore recorded a 41% increase in their running shoes sales between February and July in 2020. But what's all that physical activity doing to us? Down, knee slightly bent. Dr. Mizan, Three. avid cyclist and orthopedic surgeon, gives us the bare bones truth. Us? 12. Okay. Dr. Mizan, was there any particular type of injury that you saw an increase in uh, during or after the circuit breaker? A lot of it was uh, overuse injuries, mostly of the shoulder and knee. Two of the most common exercises now in Singapore are running and cycling. So for running, people are running uh, further distances uh, more regularly. Where they used to run 5km a week, they may now run 20 or 30. Wow, that's a huge yeah. jump, isn't it? Your body is just not used to that, to be overwhelmed with so much physical demand. But we do see things like stress fractures as well and lots of uh, long distance runners, like marathon runners, they have a lot of pain in their shins in the middle of your, of your tibia right here. Okay. And the way we, we diagnose it is, again, from the history, we know that they've suddenly ramped up their physical activity in a short period of time. So stress fractures are just like tiny cracks in the bone. Tiny cracks. Tiny cracks. Tiny, tiny cracks. Enough to cause pain, mm -hmm. you don't need surgery. So is this pandemic caused spike in injuries going to last? We see different kinds of injuries right now. Uh, we're all stuck in Singapore, right? No one's going on holiday. Mm -hmm. People are doing a lot of group exercises. Not just for the exercise, but the social aspect of it. Uh, but not everyone has the same physical level of physical fitness or, or ability. Mm -hmm. Just take it at your own pace. If you have to slow down to catch your breath or to stretch, so be it. It's, it's not a competition. Be it walking or running or cycling, the pandemic has allowed us to embrace Singapore's great outdoors. Forget the hot, trendy new bars or restaurants. National parks are now the hottest tickets in town. 2020 saw nearly 50,000 people visit Pulau Ubin, nearly double the year before. Bukit Timah Nature Reserve drew more than twice its usual visitors, hitting 75,000. And Sungai Buloh Wetland Reserve saw numbers swell three times over to 33,000. And people aren't just enjoying green Singapore. They're also trying to nurture some nature back home. In June 2020, Ant Parks announced plans to give away 150,000 packets of homegrown fruit and vegetable seeds. The response was overwhelming. They ended up handing out 400,000 packets instead. In 2020, local Facebook group Urban Farmers Singapore also saw their membership grow by a third, adding 10,000 new members. 
Why would a pandemic make urbanites like us grow green fingers? Hi, Jack. Jack Yam helps run Urban Farmers, and he's a man who knows his peonies from his pansies. Um, I've got microgreens going. This is oh. um, this is red radish. Um, this is uh, this is wasabi mustard. Wow! Yeah, pinch off a whole bunch of it. Yeah. Oh, just watch out for the <laughs> I'm not going to eat the okay. yep. ah, Thanks. Oh, wow, there it is. Wasabi. Yeah. I can taste wasabi. Yeah, so if you have a whole bunch of it, yeah, the, the kick just mm. goes like straight through. Whoa. Oh, right. And this is what they call organic, right? Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. No <laughs> pesticides. So why do you think more and more people were picking up urban farming during the pandemic? I think they had more time. There's also the, this thing about food security. Mm -hmm. I could just come out, harvest whatever I need, go in mm -hmm. and prepare dinner. Over here, this is um, rosemary, ah. um, uh, a Mediterranean herb. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Not easy to grow, ah, but nice. um, we, we like it because my wife um, does roasts, like mm -hmm. uh, roast potatoes, roast chicken. Sometimes it goes with a steak. Oh yes, yeah. oh, don't make me hungry, eh, Jack. <laughs> <laughs> it's also therapeutic to just check out your plants. So that, that probably led to the increase. So, I mean, apart from your corridor, there's some greenery on the other corridors as well. You know, have your neighbours caught on? Oh yes, I started sharing like microgreens and just to encourage them to try. And then from then on, they moved up you know, to, to leafy vegetables and stuff. So you planted the seeds in your neighbours, so to speak, and now they're bearing fruit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, in a way, yes. So this is broccoli. This is broccoli? Yeah, broccoli. Mm. So this is this is the microgreens version, basically seedlings, you know, mm -hmm. of the broccoli. Do you think the interest in urban farming is here to stay? So interest may wane, you know, um, but there are those people who have found it fulfilling mm -hmm. and definitely they are going to pursue this, you know, in the long term. All right, so lift it up mm -hmm. and we go for it and skip. What are the effects of urban farming on us in the long run? Well, definitely you see that there's a slight uh, shift in the mindset. Um, you can actually grow crops within your house with um, technological advances, um, things like um, grow lights, hydroponic systems. The authorities have taken notice of the needs of the people. They have opened up um, lots of land for small-scale urban farming, which is, which is really great. While working from home has spurred some to take up home gardening, others have clearly turned to home baking. In Singapore, searches for the word baking usually rise just a little every Christmas. But in 2020, the searches spiked in early April, after the circuit breaker was announced. I'm heading to ABC Baking Studio. Time to dust off my apron, suit up, and see if I have what it takes to bake it. Help. We have a lot of first-timers coming for our classes. And why do you think there was this increase in demand? Currently, a lot of people are working from home, so they actually have more free time to explore their hobbies. So yeah, they come for baking classes. Uh, you know, out of all the different hobbies that we could do at home, uh, why baking? Baking is a uh, skill that probably could bring them some side incomes. So after baking, they can actually sell their, their, their products. Rachel Lowe picked up baking almost a year ago. Her baked goods, however, are for personal consumption only. Have you always been someone who bakes at home? Or is this something new to you? So huh. before the skip breaker, I never thought of baking. During the two months, we actually stay at home. So I have more time to bake. Baking for me is actually therapeutic. I actually enjoy every single step of it. I signed up for the whole cake course. So I'm, I actually have plans to actually learn more techniques. Okay, let, let's try what we have baked today. Yeah, can't wait to try my medallions. Let's see. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, 
While COVID-19 has given us the opportunity to take up hobbies we wouldn't have done so otherwise, I think it's safe to say that most of us want the pandemic to end as soon as possible. And trust me, if I could beat it out of this dough, I would. With the vaccine rollout underway, it seems like all the ingredients needed to end the pandemic are there. If strict control measures in Singapore hold up against new contagious strains, most of us are unlikely to catch COVID-19. But we still need to keep our hygiene habits up, our stress levels low, oh, yeah. and our emotions in check. <laughs> Because if there is one thing the numbers have taught us, it's this. Even if the virus itself doesn't make you sick, watch out for the fallout from the pandemic. Because if we're not careful, it may well be the fallout that will hurt us. And that's why it matters.